Double Lines Deputy Chief Investment Officer Jeff Sherman joins us. Jeff, welcome back. Today's data, I would say kind of mixed, but taken as a negative. Bonds rallied on the news. Stocks sold off a little bit. The core CapEx durable goods were weaker. Personal consumption in the first quarter GDP was revised lower. Continuing claims were elevated. What kind of picture is all this painting about what we're looking to in Q2 and beyond for the economy? Yeah, well, I mean, you had you had uh, you know Atlanta Fed GDP now estimates coming in at three percent before today's data, and I, I haven't seen the update released yet uh, from them as well for the second quarter. So we're, we're obviously getting very late in the second quarter uh, with the data releases now, but we've we've been having a mixed bag in terms of as you mentioned some of the labor market data, some of the consumption data. But I was listening to your show earlier this morning, uh, Sarah. And I think you, you pretty much nailed it, saying that you know it's weaker, but it's not a, a recession's imminent or, or Fed cuts are imminent. And I know all eyes will be on the PCE um, uh, number tomorrow. But the thing about it is, is that we kind of already know what it's going to look like because most of the inputs have already been calculated in there. And so uh, the estimates are, are usually pretty spot on at this point. But the challenge that you actually have with the, the PCE and as well as the inflation numbers is that over the next three months, the numbers that are rolling off are very low numbers. Um, in fact, in core PCE, most of them are in the, like, the 10 to 15 basis point number for each of the next three uh, three months that roll off from 10, 11, and 12 months ago. And so what that means is that even though we we're yeah. seeing this improvement in the inflation data, um, it may on a year-over-year -year basis get to the point where you're going to start to see the three handles again. And so, uh, again, I think that makes it challenging to expect a, a Fed cut um, any time really before the election at this point. So I think the bond market has it priced relatively right. You know, maybe there's one cut, maybe there's two cuts, and they probably come on the back half of the year, or at least the, the last two meetings of the year. But effectively, I, I really don't think that anything in the data right now really changes the picture, yeah. except that maybe the consumption was a little overestimated in the first quarter. But we have seen that continued slowdown and a lot more balance in the labor market. So it probably is good news overall for the inflation picture. But again, just these base effects that we refer to um, are, are going to be problematic in the next couple of months. So you're going to end up getting this kind of whippy nature in some of the economic data. So what? So as for what all of that means for bonds, is it your bias that we're going to see lower yields? or higher yields because we're kind yeah, of we've been I, I in this range and like, we're you're, in, the you're really in this trading range once again yeah. and so we're kind of in the middle of the trading range so maybe you get back to like four and a half on, on the uh, on the 10 year with some positive data out there maybe we kind of test try to low maybe four percent on the 10 year again but i think it's just going to be muddled for a bit because again that's what the data has been and so uh, again even if the fed starts cutting let's say they they, they delivered a cut in september uh i mean the market's going to probably react very quickly and think oh the fed's on a massive cutting cycle but the data has to corroborate that as well that they need to at least bring it down i don't know probably 50 75 basis points to really get bonds moving so i think the bond market's already kind of anticipating that and that's why i think rates are really relatively fairly valued here and so again what this means is that um, from from a bond investment standpoint probably not too much in either direction in interest rates, but on the front end of the curve, that's really where, where people need to be thinking about, is thinking about how long can I stay in these T-bill type trades? Because again, the T-bill rates are correlated to Fed fund movements, and thus that would ultimately bring that reinvestment risk into play. So again, I think what you're seeing from investors, and, and again, on anticipating some of this data, is really saying, okay, this is the time we want to start building out the bond positions. And so, um, you know, if you look at the, the aggregate as of today will be relatively flat for the year. You can you can go out there and you can buy, build a portfolio that yields this five and a half to six percent range with high quality assets today. And it's the same thing I've been talking to you about, Sarah, uh, the last couple of times on the show. Nothing's really changed in that dynamic. Yes, spreads are a little bit tighter, um, you know, than they were earlier in the year. But in general, the thematic up in quality trade is there. So what we, we recommend for bond investors today is to stay in the high quality, have some exposure to the interest rate risk in the market today, but don't go out there and really start bottom feeding in, in today's market because the incremental spread and pickup that you get just is not compensating, compensating you for that elevated risk we see. 
Meantime, Jeff, we're going to get these uh, snap elections in France on Sunday, getting some fresh poll numbers regarding uh, the far right, the far left there. There is this ongoing chatter that uh, populist push and stagflationary risk in Europe will drive demand for U.S. assets. Do you think that drives the needle? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we saw this uh, about a week ago or two weeks ago when when uh, the, the the snap elections were first al uh, announced, and you saw this kind of risk off behavior. But it really hasn't really permeated to the U.S. market at this stage. And so, um, obviously, it's a risk. We'll, we'll see what happens over the weekend. But um, in general, I just don't think it's something that's endemic to the overall U.S. economy. And, and the stagflation narrative, I think Jay Powell said it best. At least. You know, in the U.S., that he doesn't see the stag, he doesn't see the inflation, and so uh, again, it is a, it, it's probably more problematic in that region. Uh, but again, uh, you know, if you look at the deficits, I, I saw that Deutsche Bank put out a chart yeah. this week, and they they showed that uh, the the French uh, economy hasn't ran a surplus since 1974. And that sounds really horrific, right? I mean, 50 consecutive years of running a deficit. And, you know, the, then they juxtapose it against something like Italy, which actually hasn't ran a surplus in over 100 years. <laughs> so uh, th these things are starting to pile up. And, you know, we've been talking about it here at Double Line for a while about the un untenability and the unsustainability of the, de of the debt and the deficits out there. Um, but again, I, I think that these things last a lot longer than people can, uh, than people think, and markets can can really uh, behave around them for a longer period as well. What so about, uh, I, to me, it's it, it, it's a risk out there. It's one of the geopolitical risks, but it's not something that that's, I'm going to lose sleep over this weekend. What about the U.S. debt? sustainability or in unsustainability picture and deficits. I'm, I'm asking because we're going to have this presidential debate tonight and I feel like the bond market is watching, especially if you get one party sweeping, maybe either party, it doesn't matter, concerns about what debt and spending is going to look like and what that's going to mean for the bond market. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, irrespective of, of who wins the presidential election, we're going to have large deficits. So it's just it's really where that spending gets directed. And I think y your point, Sarah, is a good one on the fact that if it is a sweep and I would I would argue that if it's a Republican sweep where they take both chambers of Congress and the White House, that um, maybe the deficits are really, really something that, that get to insane levels where we add something of the magnitude of 10 to $12 trillion to the deficit over the next four years, and that's absent some form of recession. And so in general, the, the tenability of this is, is really something that comes into question, um, but it only matters when the bond market says it matters. And so um, irrespect, I think, what do you get out of the, elect, uh, of the debate tonight, um, really, it's when the bond market starts to revolt. And um, one, one way of thinking about that is what we saw back in the UK uh, guilt crisis back in 22, right, where the bond market revolted to the policies that were being announced by Theresa May. And so yeah. I think what you'll find is that eventually the bond market will revolt and cause a problem. But that is not something that's likely, you know, over the course of this uh, of this uh, debate and, and really going to the election. It's probably something that happens when there's extreme policies and the bond market will say enough is enough. Um, and then that's when the policies will have to correct course. All right, Jeff, thank you very much. Jeff Sherman, uh, ahead of tomorrow's PCE number from Double Line.